a topic which gives us the message which both Dr. V. Subramaniam and Sadhu Aswani would have wished to pass on to us. If you wish to change your life, you must change your attitude. Change your attitude and you change your life. Are you dissatisfied with the way you are living? Do you sometimes get a feeling of disgust when you think of the way you are living? Do you wish to come out of it? There is a way. All you have to do is to change your attitude and your life will change of itself. You, many of you must have heard the name of that great American philosopher, William James. William James. They put this question to William James. They said to him, O oh, wise one, tell us what is the greatest discovery of our generation? And what answer did William James give? William James said, the greatest discovery of our generation is that by changing one's attitude, one can change one's life. And he spoke out of experience. There was a period when he passed, when he was in utter depression. He did not find life worth living. He even toyed with the idea of committing suicide. Then someone said to him, Will, why don't you try and change your attitude? Just try it out. And he said he would try it out. The next day he said, the entire day I will see that my attitude is a correct one, a constructive one, a friendly one, a cheerful one, a positive one. And he found that it made all the difference. And the day came in his life when he could declare openly to the world that the greatest discovery of our generation is that by changing one's attitude, one can change one's life. Let me tell you of an experiment which was conducted by two scientists in California, in the United States. It was a very simple experiment. They wanted to study the effect of attitudes on seeds, seeds out of which plants grow. They wanted to find out if seeds could be influenced by attitudes. As I said, their experiment was a very simple one. They took two cans exactly similar to each other. Into both the cans, they put the same quantity, the same quality of soil they dropped 23 seeds in each can. They covered the seeds with the same quantity and quality of fertilizer. They kept these two cans in a greenhouse to be able to control conditions of weather and temperature. In this experiment, everything was the same. There was only one variable. Every day they would come and stand in front of the first can. They came three times every day. Three times every day they came and stood in front of the first can and poured into it all the negativism of which they were capable. They spoke to the seeds. They insulted the seeds. They said, you are good for nothing. Nothing is going to come out of you. Even if something comes out of you, it is not going to endure, it is not going to last, and so on and so forth. Then they went and stood in front of the second can, three times every day, and poured into it all the positivism of which they were capable. You are so wonderful. Wonderful things are going to come out of you. It is going to be a sight to see what is coming out of you. This they did for 21 days, three weeks. At the end of these three weeks, they found 
that whereas out of the first can only two or three shoots of grass appeared, out of the second can they had a whole stand of grass so strong that you could hold it and with its strength you could lift up the entire can with its fertilizer and soil. If this is what attitudes can do to seeds, what can they not do to human beings? I am sure many of you have heard the name of that great psychiatrist. He is regarded as one of the greatest psychiatrists that the 20th century produced. Carl Menninger. He passed away a few years ago at the ripe old age of 93 after having built a very beautiful sanatorium at Kansas City in the United States and to his sanatorium there came some of the wealthiest Americans whose minds had been unhinged. Carl Menninger, Dr. Carl Menninger made a remarkable statement on one occasion. He said attitudes are more important than facts. Attitudes are more important than facts. The fact may be that I am passing through a dark night when not a single star doth shine. The fact may be that I suffer from an incurable disease which the doctors have declared as incurable. The fact may be that I am involved in a financial problem. I am on the verge of bankruptcy with no one to help me out. The fact may be that someone very near and dear to me has been suddenly snatched away by death. The fact may be that I am involved in a personal relationship problem which in spite of my best efforts I am unable to solve. But more than the fact, more important than the fact is how I react to it. It is not what happens to me that matters. It is how I react to what happens to me that really matters. More important than the fact is my attitude. How do I react to the problem that confronts me will determine whether I will be successful or not. It will determine whether I will be happy or not. More important than attitude is fact. And more, than, more important than fact is attitude. There are two sisters. They both suffer from cancer. They both suffer from cancer of the ovaries. The elder sister tries to keep herself cheerful and happy. So she keeps on reading books of humorous stories, jokes. She reads them and she laughs. And in her laughter, she forgets her pains and her aches. In the evening, every evening, she goes to the general hospital, the poor patient's ward, the children's section. She goes and meets the children. She's a very popular figure in the children's ward. They call her auntie. They await her coming. And there she relates to them the jokes that she has read in the morning. And the children laugh with her. And they forget their aches and pains. But the younger sister is sad, is morose, is dejected, is depressed. So one day the elder sister said to the younger sister, my dear sister, it is true that we both suffer from cancer. We both suffer from cancer of the ovaries. But it is also true that one can suffer from cancer and yet try to be cheerful and happy. It is also true that one can suffer from cancer 
and be depressed, be dejected. Which of the better, which of the two is better? Surely, to be cheerful and happy. Different people placed in similar circumstances react differently. That is why you have the two opening lines of that famous English poem. Two men stood behind prison bars. One saw mud, the other stars. Both of them were in the same situation. Both of them were prisoners. They were locked up in jail. But they looked out of the prison bars. One of them looked down and saw mud. And he said, what a dirty place I am in. The other looked up and saw stars. And he said, every star is a flower in the garden of God. Verily, I am in a garden. Different people, placed in similar circumstances, react differently. And it is on how you react that your own happiness depends. In the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord Sri Krishna, speaking unto his dear devoted disciple Arjuna, the Lord says, Arjuna, remember, man is his own friend, man is his own foe. Man is his own friend, man is his own foe. It is very easy in difficult and trying circumstances to throw the blame on others. So and so behaved like this, therefore my condition has become so miserable. No, no one outside of you can do you any harm. You yourself are your friend, you yourself are your foe. And you become your friend when you adopt a correct attitude, when you adopt a constructive attitude, when you adopt a friendly attitude, when you adopt a positive attitude, you become your enemy, you become your foe, when you adopt an incorrect attitude, a negative attitude. What is it to adopt a positive attitude? It is not that the man with the positive attitude refuses to recognize that there is the negative side of life, there is the negative side of life. Life is full of dangers and uh, disturbances. Life is full of trials and tribulations. Life is full of problems and perplexities. But the man with a positive attitude will not dwell on them. He may be surrounded by the most adverse circumstances, yet he will look for a place to stand on. Conditions all around him may be very adverse, may be very bad, but he will continue to expect the best results. And whatever you expect comes to you. Such is the law. Our expectations, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, they have a magnetic power. They draw to ourselves that which we think of that which we feel. Therefore, be very careful about your expectations. Continue to expect the best. Of course, be prepared for the worst at the same time. But continue to expect the best. Draw to yourself the best that is in life. There are so many people who think in terms of disease and death. There are so many people who think in terms of disease and death. They are the ones who are drawing through the magnetic power of their expectations, disease and death to themselves. There are so many people who think in terms of failure, defeat. Why not think of health and strength? Why not think of success and victory? That which you expect comes to you. 
I do not have the time today. Otherwise, I would love to give you many examples. But this is an inviolable law of life. Whatever you expect comes to you. But once again, a word of caution. There are times when even though when we expect the best, the worst comes to us. We should be prepared to face the worst. We should have the power to convert the worst into the best. This is true alchemy. My friends, it is true, the pathways of life are strewn with problems. But problems do not come to us by accident. Problems are deliberately thrown in our way by a beneficent providence for our own good. I wonder if you know the literal meaning of the word problem. The word problem is derived from two Latin words, pro, balo. That which is thrown in our way. Problems are deliberately thrown in our way by a beneficent providence for our own good. For it is in the measure in which we handle these problems in the right way, in the right spirit, that we are able to unfold the tremendous powers of the spirit that lie hid within every one of us. A man may be the poorest of the poor, he may be the most miserable, the most wretched man on earth, yet he is a carrier of those infinite powers, those immense energies of the eternal. If only we can unfold a fraction of them, I tell you, we will find that there is nothing that we are not able to achieve. How to unfold those powers? how to unlock those energies. One way is to handle problems in the right way. The pathways of life are strewn with problems. A professor of economics put a question to his students one day. Tell me of a product of which the demand is always less than the supply. And a student raised his hand. He got up and said, Sir, that product is problems. The supply is infinite. The demand is nil. But it is true. The pathways of life are strewn with problems. You have heard the name of Norman Vincent Peale, that great Christian preacher. He created a new atmosphere around him. He also passed away a few years ago at the ripe old age of 95. He passed away on a Christmas Eve. And I'm sure he moved on to meet his master, Christ. One day, Peel related a very amusing incident. He said a friend of his came to him and his friend said to him, Norman, I'm fed up with facing problems. If only you can indicate to me a place where I can go and stay and have no problems, I will give you $5,000. And Norman Vincent Peel told him, that's a very easy matter. Not far from here is a place where there are a hundred thousand people, but not one of them has any problems. And this friend began to jump in joy. He said, that is just the place where I want to go and live, because I'm tired of facing problems. I can't handle them anymore. And Norman Vincent Peale said to him, that is the cemetery where a hundred thousand people live. Problems are a mark of life. Problems are a sign of life. So much so, that if you find that there is a day when you have had no problems, you will be well advised to consult 
the column, obituary columns of your newspaper to find out whether your name has been mentioned there. Problems are a sign of life. Problems are a mark of life. And problems, as I said, are deliberately thrown in our way by a beneficent providence for our own good. I recall the words of Benjamin Franklin, that wise American who appeared in the 18th century. It was he who said, your attitude should always be a positive one. Therefore, you should never anticipate problems. You should never anticipate trouble nor worry about things which may never happen. Keep in the sunlight. There are so many things we worry about them, but they never happen. And in the process, we waste so much of our emotional energy. Our emotional energy is very, very, very precious. See how sad we feel? When we waste a few rupees, there was a girl who met me, she appeared to be very sad and I asked her, what is the reason? She said, the reason is this, I got my watch for 350 rupees. And the next day, my friend told me that she had got a similar watch for only 325 rupees. And the poor thing, she became sad for 25 rupees. But we waste so much of our emotional energy in vain when we worry about things which may never happen at all. There is a copybook maxim we were asked to write and rewrite that maxim when we were in school. Never trouble trouble until trouble troubles you. Never trouble trouble until trouble troubles you. That is a wonderful maxim of life. There are many things that I could tell you concerning this positive attitude, this correct attitude, this constructive attitude. As I said, there are people who expect disease and death. They think in terms of disease and death. Doctors today speak of a new type of disease. They call it symptomatic imaginitis. <laughs> People get simple symptoms and they begin to imagine that they have contracted dread diseases. There is a woman I know, every time she gets simple stomachache, she begins to imagine that she has developed cancer of the stomach. Men are no exception. I know of a brother, every time he gets simple headache, he begins to imagine that he has developed a tumor in the brain. Your imagination, as I said, your thoughts, your expectations have magnetic power. They draw to yourself things which you imagine, things about which you think. Therefore, be very careful. Be always correct in your attitude, constructive in your attitude, friendly in your attitude, positive in your attitude. There is a mother I know, she has an only child. But every time that the child is late in returning home, she begins to imagine all sorts of things. What must have happened to my child? One day, the child was late in coming by 15 minutes. But in those 15 minutes, this mother called up all the hospitals in the town to find out whether a child of uh, the age of her child had been admitted to the hospital. After 15 minutes, the child quietly returned whistling a tune, unaware of the worry that he had caused his mother. There is a man, you tell him to fly with you, 
in an aircraft, he will never set foot on an aircraft. Why? Because he will tell you, because my father died in an air crash. So he will never set foot on an aircraft. And I happened to ask him, how did your mother die? Oh, he said, she died peacefully lying in bed. And I asked him, I said, then you couldn't be lying in bed at all at night. <laughs> My time has traveled fast. There's a picture that I saw when I was a college student, and this must have been 73 years ago, yes. It has clung to my memory. I still think of it again and again. The picture it was a picture of two buckets, half filled with water. Outside one bucket, there was a face wearing a frown. And underneath were written the words of what use it is, is it to be empty all the time. Outside the other bucket, there was the face of a, there was the picture of a face wearing a smile. And underneath were written words, I am grateful to God that I am at least half full all the time. These two buckets, they symbolize the negative and the positive attitudes. The man with a negative attitude always wears a frown on his face. He feels unwanted. He feels rejected. And he does not have the wisdom, he does not have the strength to face the difficulties of life in the right spirit. But the man with a positive attitude always wears a smile on his face. He's buoyant, he's cheerful, he's happy. He has the strength, he has the wisdom to face the problems and perplexities of life in the right spirit. As I said, I could tell you, give you many examples, but my time is flying past. In the time that is yet left to me, I would wish to pass on to you some practical suggestions on how to change your attitude, how to make it a correct one, a constructive one, a friendly one, a cheerful one, a positive one. If I have the time, I would wish to pass on to you seven practical suggestions. Seven was a figure very dear to one of the great ones of ancient Greece, Tales. He loved the figure seven. What is the very first practical suggestion? The very first practical suggestion is if you want to change your attitude, you must fill your mind with healthy thoughts. Very often we pay scant attention to our thoughts. We say, after all, what does it matter? It was a thought. No. Thoughts are things. Thoughts are forces. Thoughts are the building blocks of life. Thoughts are the ink in the pain with which you are writing your own destiny. <laughs> destiny is not something which is superimposed on us from outside. We are the builders of our own destiny. We are the makers of our own faith. And the beginning is in the thought. I have repeatedly told you, but I think this bears one more repetition, that a thought, when it is held consistently in the mind within, drives you to action. It may be a thought of impurity, it may be a thought of service, 
if it is a thought of service, it will take you. It will push you on to do an act of service. If it is a thought of impurity, it will lead you into the very bottomless pit of impurity. Be very careful about your thoughts. A thought which is consistently held in the mind within drives you to action. An action which is repeated over and over again forms a habit. And be very careful about forming habits. If only we did this one thing, our coming to this earth plane will not be in vain. Form good habits. Good habits. Be very careful about forming habits. Because once you form a habit, you become a slave to it. The habit becomes the master. And if the master is a good master, it is all to your advantage. As I, as I have repeatedly said to you, habit is a terrible thing. Cut off its itch, cut off its head, a bit still remains. Cut off its A, bit still remains. Cut off its B, it still remains. Cut off its I, if there is no other habit, there is the habit of T. <laughs> T still remains. Never be very careful of forming your habits. Action, when, is, when it is repeated over and over again, forms a habit. And the sum total of our habits determines our character. And it is our character that decides our destiny. Therefore, the beginning isn't a thought. Be very careful about your thoughts. See that your thoughts are healthy. There is a wise teacher. He repeatedly says to his students, that man is the happiest who thinks the happiest thoughts. That man is the happiest who thinks the happiest thoughts. I would add, that man is the healthiest who thinks the healthiest thoughts. There is a doctor, Sarah Jones is her name. Patients with different types of maladies come to her, naturally so. And she writes out prescriptions for them. She's a consultant. But at the close of every prescription, whatever be the malady, at the close of every prescription, she adds these words. Give your mind a good shampoo every day. Give your mind a good shampoo every day. That is, get down into the bottom of your consciousness and cleanse it of all those rotten thoughts which hold it captive. There is an Indian doctor. He says to his patients, keep your upstairs clean and your downstairs will be healthy. Keep your upstairs, that is keep your mind clean, fill it with clean thoughts, fill it with healthy thoughts, and your downstairs, your body will be healthy. Whenever you get an undesirable thought, an evil thought, throw it out immediately. Don't let it enter. Tell that thought, please, house is full, there's no room for you. I remember when I was a college student, we used to sit in the class, the professor used to deliver a lecture, we used to take down notes. Suddenly, and seemingly out of nowhere, I mean you are in a class of students, but suddenly an evil thought would enter your mind. It happens in the case of every one of us. Without rhyme or reason, we get certain thoughts which we should not. They are not desirable. And then, do you know what I used to do? I used, immediately I used to slap myself. And my co-students would ask me, what happened? I used to tell them it was a mosquito. <laughs> there is no mosquito worse than an evil thought. 
Yes. Throw it out immediately. If you let it come in, it will sit as the master. Those are the words of the Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad said to his disciples, temptation comes as a passerby. It knocks on the door of your heart, allow, uh, asking you to allow it to be your guest. But if you open the door to it, it will come and sit as the master. So the very first practical suggestion is fill your minds with healthy thoughts. When you get up in the morning, take up the saying of a great one, a saint, a sage, a mystic, and keep on repeating that thought to yourself over and over again, even while you are working. You can save a few seconds. Every hour brings to you 3,600 seconds. You save 10 seconds and repeat the thought to yourself. To my friends, I often say, pick up the thought, Deena Bandhu, Deena Nath, Meri Dori, Tere Haat. Deena Bandhu, Deena Nath, Meri Dori, Tere Haat. O Lord of the lowly, of the forlorn and the forsaken ones. I surrender the thread of my life in your safe hands and I know everything is going to be well. Deena Bandhu, Deena Nath, Meri Dori, Tere. Keep on repeating that even while you are working. Save five seconds, ten seconds after every hour and repeat this. You can repeat it for five times if you can save ten seconds. Deena Bandhu, Deena Nath, Meri Dori, Tere Haat. I tell you, during the very first week of practicing the simple sadhana, you will find that you grow in awareness and you will be able to do more work. The quantity, the volume of your work will increase. The quality of your work will increase. And we go to the second practical suggestion. The second practical suggestion is never criticize anyone. Never look into the faults of others. Remember, whatever you see in others, you are only drawing to yourself. Whatever you see in others, you are only heaping on yourself. If you are seeing faults in others, you are heaping those faults on yourselves. You are giving your friends free laundry. You are cleansing them. But you are taking all that dirt into yourself. Therefore, criticize no one. Do not be a fault-finding man. There are so many who immediately, their attention will go to faults. They are made that way, but they can change themselves, change your attitude, and you change your life. I may have spoken to you today a hundred thousand words. But some of you, I am sure, will find out two or three or four or five mistakes in those hundred thousand words and concentrate on those five words. <laughs> the remaining 90, 99,995 words you will forget. That is not a correct attitude. The correct attitude is to see virtues in others. You have heard the name of Baha'u'llah the great prophet of the Baha'i faith, the most modern faith, Baha'i faith. Baha'u'llah used to say again and again to his disciples, to his devotees, that if ever you find a man who has nine vices and one virtue, think of the one virtue, forget the nine vices. If ever you see a man with nine virtues and one vice, forget the one vice, remember, consider, pay attention to the nine virtues. As you think of the virtues of others, you yourself keep on growing better and better, nobler and nobler, and your mind will be at peace and all around you will smile. 
and never say about a thing, this may be practical suggestion number three, never say about anyone, never say about any project that it will never work without giving it a chance to prove itself. There are people who are made that way. You speak to them of a new project and they will say it is impossible. It will never work. They will point to problems. They will not think of solutions. There is a man, he says, bring me the solution and I'll give you the problem. <laughs> we don't need problem-oriented people. We need solution-oriented people. The correct attitude is the attitude of thinking of solutions, not problems. There are so many people. You speak to them of any new project, oh, it is impossible, this cannot happen. This cannot happen. Who are you to determine whether it will happen or not? Bishop Wright. Bishop Wright, I think he delivered a sermon in which he said it is impossible for man to fly. It is impossible for man to fly. God has reserved this privilege of flying for birds and for angels. It's impossible for man to fly. Ten years later, in the year 1903, his own two sons, I think Orville and Grenville, uh, those were the names of the two sons. They invented the first aeroplane. <laughs> Just imagine. Robert Fulton, he was the inventor of the first steamboat. And he wanted to give a demonstration on the Hudson River. A crowd gathered to see a boat move, a boat without sails, a boat without oars. This was the first steamboat that ever was made. And among the crowd there were many who were critics. And they kept on shouting, this will never move. It has no sails, it has no oars. This boat will never move. But it moved. And when it moved, those very people began to shout, it will never stop. Never say about a thing that it will never work. And this takes me to the uh, third, uh, third or fourth, whatever you call it, practical suggestion. If you want to change your attitude, you must make your heart a singing heart. Today people have forgotten how to sing. Today we live in an age of technology. Technics has caught the heart of man. And we have forgotten how to sing. As I said, pick up a tune such as Dina Bandhu, Dina Nath, Meri Dori, Tere Haat. Or Tuma Bina Meri, Kau Nukha Barale, Govar Dhanagir Dhal. Or a tune like Jis Ke Sir Upar Tu Mera Sai. Or if there are any Christian friends of mine here, they can repeat, they can take up the tune. God is my shepherd and I shall not want. Hum it to yourself again and again. When you get up in the morning, before you open your eyes, before you leave your bed, hum this tune. At least ten times. Dina bandhu, dina naat, meri dori te. Each one of us is a bathroom singer. We don't have to sing before the public. But we can sing to ourselves. As we sing to ourselves, we will develop a singing heart. And once our heart starts to sing, our attitude will always be a correct one. <coughs> Pick up any tune that you like. Keep on humming to yourself. And as I told you, 
Every hour brings to us 3,600 seconds. Yes, save 10 seconds after every hour and hum to yourself. You can even hum silently. It's not necessary that you do it orally, loudly. But keep on doing it so that your heart becomes a singing heart. I know of children, as they go about, they keep on singing. Of such, said Jesus, is the kingdom of heaven, which is the kingdom of happiness. And this takes us to practical suggestion number five. Practical suggestion number five is cultivate faith in the goodness and the caring power of God. Cultivate faith in the goodness and the caring power of God. God is all love. God is all wisdom. He is too loving to punish, too wise to make a mistake. Therefore, in everything that happens, because everything happens according to the will of God, not a leaf stirs except it be His will. And because He is our Father, every day we pray, do we not? Tomeva Mata, Chapita Tomeva. Every day we offer the Sikh Guru's prayer, Tu Mata Pita Hamabarika Tere. Millions of Christians, billions of Christians all over the world, they repeat the prayer that was given them by blessed Jesus, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In our prayers, we address God as our Father and as our Mother. But in our daily life, do we live as children? Have you ever seen a child living under a cloud of worry, fear, anxiety? The child knows its mother is near, it has not to fear. Have you ever seen a child, you give it food to eat, and he goes and hides a portion of it somewhere, lest he may not be given food again. He is absolutely sure, the mother is there, she has given me food now, she will give me food again at the right time. Live like children, cultivate faith in the goodness and the caring power of God. There is a meaning of mercy in everything that happens, everything underlying. We may not be able to see the mercy in a particular event or incident at that time. But a time will come when it will be revealed to us that there was a mercy in what we regarded as a calamity, as an adversity, as a misfortune. There was a shopkeeper, he started from scratch. He built up a flourishing business. After several years of hard work, he took a holiday. He went out for a fortnight. He had built a furniture shop. He had, he had started as a carpenter, but then he developed it into a f furniture shop. He had so many employees working under him, but he went out for a fortnight, for a holiday. After years of laborious work, when he returned, he was told that in his absence, his shop, his house, everything had caught fire, and everything was reduced to the shambles. Mr. Shankar told us that a similar thing had happened to this hall a few years ago, and it was uh, our beloved Dr. V. Subramaniam, who has rebuilt this. And this furniture merchant, when he returned, he found his dreams, his aspirations, reduced to ashes and dust. But he was a man of faith. He said, there must be a meaning in it. He fixed a pole on those ashes, and took up a cardboard, on it he wrote the words, shop burnt, furniture burnt, house burnt, but faith not burnt. 
shall restart tomorrow. They were the men of faith. They were the men of faith. And practical suggestion? Practical suggestion number six. Practical suggestion number six is you must develop a healthy sense of humor. Today people have forgotten how to laugh. I am happy today you have laughed again and again. <laughs> but otherwise people have forgotten how to laugh. May I tell you, there was a woman who met me and she said to me, we have been married for 12 months and in these 12 months my husband has laughed at me, has smiled at me only three times. <laughs> Just imagine. Just imagine a husband smiling at his wife only for three times. Laughter is an all-round tonic. Laughter is a physical tonic, it is a mental tonic, it is a spiritual tonic. Laughter strengthens the lungs, laughter aids circulation, laughter builds the immunity system. But please, as I have repeatedly asked you, never laugh at others. Laugh with others. <laughs> laugh with others, but never laugh at others. If you want to laugh at anybody, you can always laugh at yourself. Every one of us has his own weaknesses, faults, feelings, frailties. We can laugh at ourselves. But learn to laugh, learn to laugh. I tell my friends that you have no right to take breakfast until you have had three laughters. And again at lunch, and again at dinner. We must learn to laugh more and more. We could have a, we could have a very small laughter session now. There was a child, he said to his father, I love your mother, that is, I love my grandmother, and I am going to marry her. <laughs> and the father said, how can you marry my mother? But said the child, how did you marry my mother? <laughs> Why can't I marry your mother? Our laugh should be a regular belly laugh, otherwise it won't be an exercise. Otherwise it won't be a tonic. It should be a whole regular belly laugh. There was a student, he said to his teacher, Teacher, is it right to punish a person for what he has not done? And the teacher said, it's absolutely wrong. How can you punish a person for what he has not done? And the student said to her, teacher, I have not done my homework. <laughs> <laughs> there was a professor and a farmer. They were both traveling together in a train. And just to pass time, the professor suggested to the farmer, he said, let us try to solve riddles. You give me a riddle. If I can solve it, you pay me a hundred rupees. If you cannot solve it, pay me a hundred rupees. Ah, I'm sorry. If you can solve it, I will pay you a hundred rupees. If you cannot solve it, you will have to pay me a hundred rupees. But the farmer said, no, that is not fair. You are a highly learned man. You are a professor in a university. I am only a kisan. I am only a farmer. So if you cannot solve my riddle, you pay me 100 rupees. If I cannot solve your riddle, I will pay you only 50 rupees. Done, said the professor. And the professor said to the farmer, tell me the riddle. And the farmer said to him, what is that? which when it walks it has three legs, when it flies it has two legs. The poor professor thought and thought and thought, but he could not think, think of a creature having three legs when it walked 
and having two legs when it flies. So finally, the professor said, "I give up," and he paid him hundred rupees. And now the professor put to him the same question, the same riddle: What is that which, when it walks, has three legs? When it flies, it has only two legs. And the kisan immediately told him, "I don't know either," and paid him fifty rupees. <laughs> <laughs> there were three priests. They were discussing how they shared their collections with the world. The first priest said, "I draw a line on the floor, and I throw up the collection in the air, and whatever falls on the right side of the line belongs to God." Whatever drops on the left side belongs to me. And the other priest said, "I don't draw a line. I draw a circle. I go and stand in the center of the circle, and I throw up the collection. Whatever falls in the circle belongs to me. Whatever falls outside the circle belongs to God." The third priest said, "My method is a very simple one." I don't draw lines and circles. I throw the entire collection up to God, and I tell Him, "Keep what you like. Whatever He throws down belongs." To me. <laughs> Now there are only five minutes more, six minutes more. The last practical suggestion, isn't it? The last practical suggestion. The seventh practical suggestion is help others. If you want to change your attitude, you must help others. You must be filled with that spirit of helpfulness. Today, whenever I go to big cities, I find that people are so indifferent to the needs of others. They say it is none of our business. Surely, it is your business. Humanity is one family. Family. Every man is my brother. Every woman is my sister. It is my duty, to the best of my ability, to the best of my capacity, to help my brothers and my sisters. I've often said this: that the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is apathy. indifference to the needs of those that are around you therefore help others help as many as you can to lift the load on the rough road of life there is a story concerning a king and his minister he calls his minister and says to the minister i want you to answer four questions <coughs> The first question is, what is it if I give here, I get the reward here? The second question is, I give here, but I get the reward there. The third question is, I give here. and i get the reward neither here nor there and the fourth question is what is the right way of giving and the minister says to the king o oh, king give me 3 lakhs of rupees and give me a week's time and i will let you have the answers so the king willingly gave 3 lakhs of rupees and after a week they met once again and the minister said to him i am ready with the answers what you give here you get the reward here is what i did with 1 lakh of rupees i went and deposited them in a bank in your name you have given here 
you will get the reward which will be the interest on the amount here. The second lakh of rupees, I went and bought dresses and food and distributed them in your name among the slum dwellers, the poor people, the starving ones. I gave here, but you will get the reward there. And the third lakh of rupees I spent in vain, vain pleasures. Wine, song, dance. I spent it here. I gave here. But neither you nor I will get the reward here or there. It's wasted money. And he said, I have consulted all the scriptures of the word. And I have found that the best way to give is to give without any thought of reward. Let it be a Krishna Arpanam, Krishna Arpanam. Give without any thought of reward, here or there or anywhere. Is that not the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita? Give, give. Each one of us has to be a giver. We are living in a universe in which everything is giving. You saw in the movie, didn't you? The trees give, the rivers give, every element of nature gives. We have to give. Sadhu Aswani said to us one day, I have but one tongue. If I had a million tongues with every one of those million tongues, I would still utter the one word, give, give, give. Those that give live, those that give not are no better than dead souls. So you must give, but without any thought of reward. Let it be an offering at the lotus feet of the Lord. If only you will give in the spirit, your attitude will automatically change. It will automatically change and it will affect your entire life. Give without any thought of reward. There is a touching incident in the life of that great German philanthropist some of you may have heard his name, Oberlin. Oberlin was one day caught in a fierce snowstorm. He shrieked for help, but his shrieks were lost in the fierce wind. There was a storm which was blowing and snow was falling. Until exhausted, he dropped down on the snow, unconscious. A peasant happened to pass by and finding a fellow human being lying unconscious on the snow, picked him up in his arms and brought him to the warmth of his hut. There Oberlin revived and looking into the eyes of his saviour said to him, you have saved my life. He was a phil philanthropist. He believed in giving. He said to him, he said to the peasant, you have saved my life, I will give you a very, very rich reward. But the peasant said to him, reward? For what? Reward? For what? I have done what it was my duty to do. I saw a fellow human being lying on snow, unconscious, and I brought him to the warmth of my hut and revived him. This was my plane, it was my duty to do. How can I accept a reward for it? Then Oberlin pleaded with him, at least tell me your name, what is your name? And the peasant asked him, is the name of the good Samaritan mentioned in the Bible, mentioned in the New Testament? Jesus gives us a parable of the new, of the good Samaritan. No, said Oberlin, the name has not been mentioned. Then said the peasant, let me withhold mine. There was a man who knew what it was to give. Give in that spirit. Give in the spirit of Arpanam. The best speech is silence. The best silence is worship. The best worship is yagna, sacrifice, offering. The best offering is Arpanam. The best Arpanam is 
श्री कृष्ण अर्पणम श्री कृष्ण अर्पणम श्री कृष्ण अर्पणम मे एवरी थिंग दैट वी डू लिटिल और ग्रेट मे एवरी थिंग वी डू be our offering at the lotus feet of the lord call him by whatever name you will krishna is only one names by which he is called one of the names by which he is called call him by any name you will but make of your life your entire life an offering at the lotus feet of the lord and you will be abundantly blessed and you will be a source of blessing to multitudes i thank you ओम शांति शांति शांति